So when I first went down there, mid-2000s, I was just so amazed because I was watching all the Americans there drinking rum, smoking cigars. You know, it was more of a social activity. And I was like, I must be a nerd because I'm going in bookshops and I'm just like first edition prints. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, nobody's seeing what I'm seeing. Print friends, and welcome to the 54th episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release weekly podcasts with people in the print world who are doing something a bit beyond the expected. So please subscribe on your podcast listening app of choice. You can also find Pine Copper Lime on Instagram and Facebook. And you can sign up for our monthly newsletter with print news from around the world, all at pinecopperlime.com. We also have a Patreon page, where, if you like this podcast and you want to give us a couple bucks a month, we love you for it and it makes a world of difference to us. Thank you so much to those who have signed up, even in the time of COVID, even in the time of quarantine. You are filling my heart. Printmaking forever, shun the non-believers. This episode of Pine Copper Lime is brought to you by our sponsor, Speedball Art Products, who've been bringing you a diverse range of high-quality products to your creative practice since 1997. Their newest exciting initiative is Speedball's Print Posse. Working with contemporary printmaking icons, Speedball has invited each artist to design and name an ink of their choosing. Artists like Killjoy, star of Pine Copper Lime episode number 36, whose ancient clay relief ink is a stunning warm clay color, perfect for hanging in the studio on these late days of summer. Shop at speedballart.com to find out where you can pick up a can of your new favorite. My guest this week is Newton Paul. Newton is a collector and researcher of African American and Cuban prints from both contemporary and historical artists. And print friends, Get your pen and paper out for this one. Newton is a fountain of knowledge and resources when it comes to these subjects, and you're going to learn about incredible new printmakers you would never heard of before. I've put links as much as I can to everything in the show notes. Newton shares with us how a chance encounter at the Harlem Fine Arts Show started him on his journey into the world of printmaking. His travels to Cuba and working in the archives there and the thrill of discovery forgotten in lost histories in 20th century printmaking. I had a teensy bit of audio trouble on this one, so Newton's track has a slight buzz, but stay with me, print friends. It goes away in the first five minutes. I promise. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and prepare to dive into those archives with Newton Paul. Hi, Newton. How's it going? It is going well, Miranda. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to have this discussion with you. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat. It's interesting because I don't know that I've ever had anyone on the podcast before who basically met how we met, which is we just got to chatting on Instagram Messenger, and I started to hear all these projects that you're doing, and... I thought, people need to know about this. (laughs) So I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to get to know you a little bit better and to hear about everything you're doing. And I'm hoping before we dive in, you'd be okay giving a little introduction of yourself, which I usually call the who you are, where you are, what you do questions. Okay. Um, Well, first, before I begin, I just want to thank you again for uh, reaching out and working with me to kind of share this information. And thank you for your contribution to the printmaking Mm -hmm. movement. I think this is really a a good way to keep pushing the agenda and getting printmaking on the map even further. And uh, there was a quote that came to mind on how we connected. uh, And the quote is by Rumi. It's, what you seek is seeking you. Yeah. 
for the life of me, just connecting with you after seeing that uh, write up was just one of the best things that could have happened for me in terms of, again, contributing to the printmaking movement. Yeah, so uh, my name is Newton Paul. I'm the founder of the Armand Paul Family Collection based in New York. Historically, uh, previously, I worked in pharmaceuticals and was laid off approximately four years ago. Uh, but during that time, prior to getting laid off, I was actually involved with the MoMA Friends of Education Board for three years. I'm currently on the El Museo del Barrio Board in New York, which was actually paramount in the exhibition of Belkis Ayan, the contemporary Cuban printmaker, the master printmaker. And I'm also currently on the Print Club of New York Board as acting secretary. And so that's my current role. How did you come to printmaking? So it sounds like, you know, you had this uh, opportunity when you found you were no longer to be working in pharmaceuticals to kind of transition some of your focus to art. But how did printmaking sort of rise to the top of that interest? Well, um, when I, the first print I actually was exposed to was on a show on ABC um, in New York called Like It Is with Gil Noble. And this show was particularly focused on Black culture and Black experiences. And during the show, in the beginning of the show before it started, you would hear these drums going in the background. And then this print would zoom to the camera. And once the print got to the front of your screen, the drums would stop and the show would start. And I was in elementary school at the time. And that print was actually Charles White's work. So I was able to find out the history behind that, but I, I, I could get into that a little later. But, um, and then um, the next part of really um, connecting with printmaking was my first acquisition at the Harlem Fine Arts Show in 2009 by an artist named Kevin Williams. And he's on Instagram, art by walk, W-A-K. And it was a piece of a uh, of a woman that was scrubbing the floor, and within the wood was ingrained an image of a slave ship. And I stood in front of the piece for about forty minutes, maybe thirty minutes. To, I don't know how long it was, but it was a long time. And then tears started to stream mm -hmm. out of my eyes because it touched something in me, and it just reminded me of you know, my mother, you know, immigrants from Haiti, and she used to do this type of work uh, for families that had a lot of money. And so I would always think about those times that she wasn't around because I would see her leaving in the uniform. Mm. And during that time that I was studying the piece, the owner of the Black Arts in America, Najee Dorsey, walks over to me and he's asking me questions about the piece. And I shared my thoughts and he said, all right, I'll give you some time with it. He walked away and then he came back and he's like, I think you should get it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I bought it. That was like my first major piece. And I still look at it today and it still gives me that emotional feeling and the beauty of it after, you know, acquiring this work and thinking that I do the right thing because I paid a lot of money. I've never thought about paying art at that level. And they sent me a, a very nice, classy note, him and his wife congratulating me on my first acquisition. And, and I was hooked. Like, that was like the first piece that really struck me. And then as I started to research more, I came across a book, uh, African-American artists from 1929 to 1945, Prince Drawings and Paintings, which was uh, donated to the Met Museum by Reba and Dave Williams, uh, who are two prominent collectors. I mean, Dave Williams passed away, but Reba is still writing. But that was the first time that the Met Museum had such a large acquisition of African-American prints. So as I started to research that, that book and study it, I was looking at all these artists, Ernest Critchlow, uh, Elizabeth Catlett, uh, Charles White. I mean, it was Henry Tanner, just a, 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 a huge amount of 
experts that were never given that recognition. And this was like the first time on that platform to be exposed at that level. So after I read that book, I, I, they came out with another book called Small Victories, One Couple's Surprising Adventure to Collecting American Prints. And it was just everything. So they talked about collecting American prints, African-American prints, Mexican prints. And, you know, Mexican printmaking has a huge history. And my next exposure to that was Philadelphia Museum when they did the Frida Kahlo Mexican Revolution exhibition. And seeing those prints just blew my mind. Like, just the context of socialism, uh, American capitalism, and some of these other societal issues and political viewpoints that were captured in the work. So that that was like when I was really, I wasn't buying anything. I was just getting engulfed into it. And then I read a few more books, um, Black Printmakers and the WPA by Leslie King, uh, Collecting African-American Art by Halima Ta, and David Driscoll, rest in peace, artist and scholar. And, and the last book is African-American Printmaking, 1838 to Present, which was curated by Lena Hugh and Dr. Cynthia Hawkins. And Dr. Cynthia Hawkins is paramount to the next phase of uh, trying to show the Association of the Grabadours, the Cuba prints that I have over time. And, you know, I benchmarked other collectors like Dr. Dr. Richard Sims, who had collected one of the largest uh, collections of uh, Katie Colwitz, and he donated it all to um, to the Getty Museum. And I was just reading about him. I never heard him about him, but when I read his history, I was like, "Man, that's me. That that's the first time you know, for me to acquire a large amount of Cuban prints from that particular period. I'm actually in that realm of tra trailblazing it and." getting this out to the people. So I'm just trying to figure that out right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, I just, that's an incredible story. And I feel like all of those books that you mentioned, I'm just like furiously scribbling the names of them. So I'll have to put them in the show notes because I feel like people will really be interested in, um, maybe coming across and reading some of those books themselves. Uh, cause one of the things about, printmakers is that printmakers love the history of printmaking. I think it's so interesting because I don't necessarily see that in other media. Maybe that's just because I'm not as involved in it, but I've almost every printmaker I know, like they love Dürer, they love Goya, they love right. reading and writing about it. I don't know if like ceramicists feel the same way, where they're still looking at 16th and 17th century works and saying, "Oh, that like that was it. That was some glorious ceramics," you know? Right, <laughs> right, right. So, so they love that. So, I'll when I go back through, I'll see if I can pop some of that in the show notes. Some of the names of those those books because I definitely want to see them. Another critical piece with uh, Reba and Dave Williams, they actually created a print movie, which mm. nobody really knew about. And it's called, I believe, All About the Prints. And they interview uh, some of the curators in London and getting this whole context, this history of printmaking, which was fascinating because I think they were actually the first ones to actually put a documentary type style to it. Oh, I'd love to see that. Amazing. So as you mentioned when we were chatting, the Association de Grabadoras de Cuba, which was kind of the first thing that we first started chatting about, because it was, um, as the name suggests, an association of graphic artists in Cuba. But I had never heard of it before. And as I started looking around and doing some Googling on it, I was seeing the incredible images that were made. And as you mentioned, you're in the process of collecting the work and doing some research on it. And I'm wondering if you can just speak to it kind of generally to give people listening an overview about, you know, why it was founded and when and how you first kind of got involved in this undertaking. Well, Cuba has a rich history of printmaking 
dating back to the 1800s. Um, a lot of French uh, printmakers came there and did their work, and over time it started to decline. But printmaking was used for cigar labeling and cigar boxes. Uh, Association de Grabadores de Cuba, they started in December of 1949, and the leader of that group was Carmelo Gonzalez, who was also a painter, um, but he was driving the whole concept of getting printmaking started. So it was himself and 11 other artists, and I could run down their names, Armando Pose, Luis Penlavar, Armando Fernandez, Ana Rosa Geritz, Jose Lopez, Angel Marti Dennis, Eugenio Rodriguez, Rolando Santana, Israel Cordova, and Halobin Lopez. And these are the members that actually formed the group to start, and uh, George Regal, I cannot forget George Regal. Um, so these groups were also interacting uh, in a global printmaking community because some of the members started studied at the Talia de Grafica Popular in Mexico, the Art Students League in New York, Czechoslovakia, Soviet Union, uh, German Democratic Republic, Albania, People's Ch Republic of China, and all these other countries, but and actually probably interacted with some of these well-known artists, but you know it's, it wasn't captured in any of the history books that I started to search around, except for one particular book in the States that it was a printing organization in Manhattan that created an edition where they compiled all eight of the books over time. And they speak about Lesbia Vente Dumas, who was, uh, who was a, a member of the Association of the Grabadors, who created these large panel prints that are actually in the collection of UCLA, but it was her and Luis Penlevar and Carmelo Gonzalez that did these large prints that have never been done before on that scale. So, you know, that's the first time I've seen anything about that particular group. And so as they continue to bring uh, printmaking to that notoriety, they started inviting other artists to the country to do some work. Um, and one artist in particular out of the group that struck my mind is uh, George Regal, who studied in Mexico for about eight years. And you could see the style of his work. You could tell that he's took some of the muralism printmaking styles from there and brought it back to Cuba and exchanged it with the other group members. So it's, it's really cool history. I know when we were chatting about it earlier, you said it was a bit like maybe the WPA in the States. So were a lot of them commissioned by the government? I mean, is it similar in that way or just kind of similar in aesthetically? What's the sort of connection there? For one, I think some of these artists did interact with uh, members from the WPA based on the fact that Carmelo Gonzalez did study in New York uh, under the Artists uh, League. So, you know, I just know that all this information has been exchanged and brought back, but from the platform, not so much the platform of government support, but more on the sense of the quality, the aesthetic of the work. Because it, had I not studied uh, some of the African American printmakers or just American printmakers and even some of the European printmakers, I would have never developed that eye to see like what is masterful work. And so here I am going to Cuba and I'm looking at the work and I'm like, wow, this is incredible work. But it wasn't until I got into the archives that are in the government and I was actually looking at the equipment. Some of these printmakers developed their own equipment, like they designed it to fit the way they were going to produce the work. And let's think from 1949 to 68, that was a time embargo was heavy. So Cuba wasn't getting ink. They weren't getting the proper materials, so they had to be creative down to, down to paper. And that's even today. Getting paper is, is such a difficult thing. And then to maintain and preserve the material is another issue within itself. Yeah, yeah. Is it... Um, now, I've never traveled to Cuba or, or 
really, I think, you know, anywhere in that part of the world so much, you know, closest I've been is Florida, of course, but is it, um, is it quite hot and humid there as well? Because I know when you're talking about preservation and paper, that is such an issue. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, so I, I again, the, another part of the research and my studying was collaborating with uh, Enrique Morales Tente. Um, that was the artist that we also talked about, who is a phenomenal artist, part of the Mano Negra group. But I also developed a relationship with uh, Yamilis Burrito, who's the first female of the Talia Experimental de Grafica in Havana, which is the oldest print uh, shop in that area. And uh, she's the first female since I think it was in, uh, conceived or started back in 1952 or 62. I can't remember offhand, but she she actually 62. She was the one that actually allowed me into the archives and, and go through the work. And some of this stuff was disintegrating in my hands. And I was just like, you know, down to even getting supplies for white gloves to handle the stuff. And then you could see the foxing in the material. So I, I told her as a project for myself, if she could get me two interns, I will come back and photograph and provide several hard drives for them to maintain this stuff and to figure out how we could get wax paper because uh, the, the way they have it saved, I mean, and these are works dating back to the uh, 50s and 60s that are just important pieces of work mm. and they're they're not going to sustain if if we don't get them into the right space. So were you able to return with the interns and do that documentation project? No, I committed to her um, this past December that I would do it. So we were looking, targeting uh. this December uh, 2020 to do it. So pending on this whole COVID situation, mm -hmm. I, I definitely want to go back and spend at least a week because, I mean, it's files of just beautiful work. Uh, I'm so I'm having so much jealousy feelings right now. <laughs> like... Oh, don't be jealous. Go down. <laughs> Apartments are like ten dollars a day. And it's three to five, seven dollars. You could live a really comfortable life. Yeah. There. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely like my mind's like, what am I doing in December 2021? Can I like, <laughs> can I come along? Can I help? Like, it just sounds so incredible. You let me know and we'll, I'll meet you there and we'll connect with all the printmakers and uh, people that are influential and, and hey, this could be part of your podcast. Absolutely. I would love that. I would love that because it's I think that Cuba holds this absolute uh forbidden fruit quality to i think a lot of americans you know in the sense of of you know back of course before covid before the insanity that we're in now there were so few places that were kind of forbidden to travel to and so when you right. grow up and it's like oh you can't go to cuba then of course anyone at least anyone with like my like personality type is like well that's where i want to go that's the only place i want to go you know <laughs> exactly exactly well you know that's the and that's the beauty of it so when i first went down there uh you know on my um in early two or mid 2000s i was just so amazed because i was watching all the americans they're drinking rum smoking mm. cigars you know, it was more of a social activity. And I was like, I must be a nerd because I'm going into <laughs> bookshops and I'm just like first edition prints. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, nobody's seeing what I'm seeing. And so, you know, people think that, oh, you're American, you're one off. So I'm going to, you know, try to leverage this whole situation because I'll probably never see you again. So when they saw me coming back every three months, mm. every two months, they were like, wait a minute, this guy is serious. Yeah. And I was just. I was in their museum. I would sit in the print section of their permanently exhibited works, which I've been fortunate to acquire eight of those prints. And it's just like, I, I know in this country, I would never have that yeah. opportunity or rarely have the opportunity to own prints that are permanently exhibited in their national museum. So here I am holding these pieces and I'm like, I can't believe it. It's mm -hmm. like, it's, 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 it's just a, a, a beautiful thing and I just want to share it. 
it's so wonderful to find something like that in one's life where you come come across something or stumble across something that you get that feeling of this is incredible and not enough people know about this and I'm in a position where I can help share it. It's an amazing feeling. And I think that in a way, just being in prints kind of gives you that feeling every day, at least for me, because it is so printmaking is so incredible and so few people know about it. So this is just, yeah, a specific example within that whole world of printmaking, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and you know, the beauty of this all is I'm slightly colorblind. Oh, really? So for me, yeah, uh -huh. we're, you know, people are surprised, but it, and I guess that's why I appreciate the detail more than anything. And, you know, sometimes I might not see a color and I'm just like, well, I can see what the image is communicating. And mm -hmm. that's the beauty of prints for me. Yeah. Since you've gotten to know this association and started doing research into it, um, what years was it active and why was it disbanded in the end? The way I really got into a deeper uh, appreciation for it, I went to the Met Museum in New York's library mm -hmm. and I got a library pass and they had uh, the only collection, I didn't know they had it, the only collection written or book written on this particular group which was all in Spanish. So I Google translated the entire book. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so from there, I created a timeline of pieces that I would be interested in acquiring. So I I looked up the, um, the author of the book, Dr. Olga Nunez, and contacted the, the National Museum. I said, I need to get in touch with this woman. I need to get a video crew and interview her. And... They gave me her location, and Enrique Tente Morel is the printmaker, um, escorted me to go meet her. We didn't get a, uh, a crew at that time, so I used my tablet to record the interview in her home. And such an elegant woman, and she knew these individuals and, and wrote the book in 1983, I believe. And she was just so impressed with me about translating the book and when i walked in she gave me a copy and autographed it and forget about it. i geeked out my <laughs> friends are looking at me like what is wrong with you i was like you have no idea what is happening now like this is like people meet the beatles or somebody like <laughs> me getting this book from this icon is like mind-blowing because now i got my own and then it just triggered me to learn about the history so the group uh, was active from 1949 to 1968. So they just celebrated their 70th anniversary about two years ago. And I was pushing it to try to get it into museums for an exhibition to honor that 70 years. But after reaching out to 80 to 100 print curators, museums, none of them responded. There was no interest. And what the, the crazy part about it is, I've read so much about uh, all these great collectors like Reba and Dave Williams and Dr. Sims donating their stuff. And I actually was going to give the whole collection. I mean, books, brochures, you name it. I was just going to give it all away. And then so when I experienced that, I was like, oh, let me take a step back and figure out another way to just get this out there. So from so they were active from 49 to 1968. Well, in 1968, that's when the revolution had uh, really hit its peak and the government nationalized all private entities. So the the group had their own print space on, I think, I believe it's 908 Neptune, which I actually visited the location, but it's now a residence. And the government basically took over these spaces and controlled it. So then they basically closed shop and some of them continued to work at the Talier Experimental de Grafica or created their own uh, print shop as their own business or collaborated with other print shops like Rene uh print shop in Havana, which is very big on serigraphs and poster making and other printmaking uh, tools. So 
the last phase before I got to the association that grabbed the doors. On the weekends in Havana, in the it's called Parque Central, Central Park, which is like right downtown. And it's this promenade that goes stretches from the Capitol all the way down to the waterfront called Malikon. So on weekends, there's all these artists that set up their booths and they're showing their works for tourists and locals to buy their work. So I, a friend of mine, Ralph Sanchez, and I were visiting Cuba at the time and we're walking by and we see this print, these prints, and it's like, you can't help but to stop. And we're studying them. And I looked at this one piece that I was interested in and Ralph looked at me, he's like, hey, check this piece out. <laughs> so I, when I saw the piece, I was just frozen because the the way the work is done is, is the back of uh, someone's head. And you could tell that they're of African descent, but their hair is braided in corn rolls. And within the corn rolls is a tractor trailer cutting between the rows. And as the hair is going up, it's forming Cuba upside down. I was I was blown away. And shout out to Ralph Sanchez for putting me in that direction because, and as I spoke to Enrique, he was explaining how Afro-Cuban life has contributed so much from an economic standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, and anything in Cuba, you cannot remove the Afro-Cuban presence. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And then this is when I knew he was a different caliber of artist because everybody questioned him, like, why are you out here? You don't need to be out here. Like he was the top of his printmaking class at the San Alejandro Institute, which is where all the artists go through. And here he is in the street. And he said to me, he's like, in order for me to produce work, I got to be in touch with the people. And you can see it in his work. It's like, it's just mind blowing. You reached out to me originally just to share his work. And right. yeah, and and I was completely blown away by it. I know the image that you're speaking of. It's one of the few images of his work that are online. He doesn't have a huge presence. His dry points are unbelievable. Like they uh they're, they're really unlike anything I've I've ever seen before. And not only are they just technically stunning, but the content of them is so powerful and so smart. And right. it's that kind of perfect storm of talent and, uh, you know, it's, it's like like talent and content and execution and all of it coming together that you really see rarely in the art world. And so that's why it is incredible to hear that you discovered him just showing his work on the street, you know, in in sort of just like a, a public corridor, because I'm sure we can all picture the kind of work that we usually see when we're in major public spaces in different parts of the world. Right. And people, like you know, touristy areas. Touristy yeah. areas. Exactly. And it's um it's usually like fine and and goodness knows I would I would never want to throw shade on anyone making their living creating visual work but right. it does it does not turn your head the way Enrique Tente Morales's work does no the guy is incredible and I and there's times when I'm there I'll sit there for two hours and I'll just watch the people's reaction to I this bet. work <laughs> whether it's from Germany Europe and these people will pay a thousand dollars right there twelve hundred dollars on the spot for his work. But, you know, and uh, the beauty of my experience in Cuba, it always circles back. So I'm talking to him and then I bring up the association. He's like, oh, Armando Pose was my professor. Now, Armando Pose was one of the founding members of the group and also of the Talia Experimental de Grafica. So right there, I was like, iron sharpens iron. Like, this man learn from one of the greats and turned around and is producing masterful work. And again, it's like he doesn't have that platform, which I'm working with him on to connect them with the right people because he's brilliant. He's just a brilliant artist. And then so 
you two sort of started to collaborate on collecting and preserving the works that were produced in the association. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so basically, I continue to go down there, go to their libraries, go to their archives. You know, your Millis was in instrumental in connecting me with the right people. Then I met Lesbia. So there's four living members still of the group. Uh, Umberto Peña, who's located in Spain. Uh, Cesar Mazzola, who's living in Mexico. Uh, Alfredo Soso Bravo and Lesbia are the only two living in Cuba. So I had the chance to meet Lesbia, um, who actually has the Carmelo Gonzalez con collection. And so I basically connected with her, interviewed her, and then said, listen, I'd like to interview the other members. So just by chance, uh, she was able to contact uh, Soso Bravo and Cesar Mazzola was going to be honored in Cuba. So he was actually flying out there. And I got Dr. Olga Nunez, the author of the book, to come. So we basically, I hired a film crew. We did the interview with the Amelis and she moderated it and asked questions about the group. And there's information that just was coming out, all this in Spanish. But after the fact, I was learning that a lot of information came out that wasn't in the book. So I told Dr. Nunez I would like to republish the book and create a second edition and add the information and also add the prints that weren't exhibited in the uh, first book. So everybody's on board. Now it's just a matter of how do we execute and get it done because most of them are up in age. And so I, that that's the big struggle, you know, but I got a video of these last Three, three living members, and I actually sent Umberto Peña a document to respond to questions, and he actually responded back to those. So uh, now I'm in the phase of actually archiving paper interviews, all the uh, video interviews, any documentation that I had, even my tickets to fly there, passport stamps, because I didn't realize the importance of it. And I was like, I want to actually let somebody see how I went about doing it and just... You know, so we, there's other places in the world that's just still undiscovered talent and in printmaking, where there's uh, Thailand rubbings, which they, they don't do anymore. That got banded in the 70s. And I lucked out and got a print of that. But, you know, I just want people to think beyond just the scope of mainstream to actually get into the community, talk to people and, and find where prints are, find where these undiscovered masterpieces are and try to bring them up to the global uh, status of printmaking. It really brings to the forefront in my mind this idea that because we have the internet, because we have you know, artsy printmaking Instagram that you can follow and see great artists every day on because we've got all these connections and print groups on Facebook with 26,000 people. We get this illusion that we know global printmaking, that we can know it just from sitting behind our desktops. Right. But of course we can't because so much of the world doesn't champion and privilege this you got to make it digital or it didn't happen. I think that's just a very Western, very American attitude where you'll find incredible artists throughout the world who, you know, like Enrique, who don't even have an Instagram. They're not, they're not thinking that way. It's not, it's, it's this, this, we're, we're the capitalism is so much the water that we're born into and the water that we swim in that we don't understand that it's there. And it's like, if you're not promoting yourself, how are you even making work? Is this, right. it, they're, they're one in the same in our mentality. And because of that, I don't think it occurs to us sometimes the incredible talents and the incredible variety of work that's going on outside of that scope and outside of that mentality in the world. No, absolutely. And that's where, even in the book that I'm writing, I'm, I'm trying to articulate that the museums, I think, should actually look at hiring somebody as an outsider to go out and look at prints, look at different artwork, and actually bring it back to the group and present it. Because I think, you know, curators are 
overwhelmed. So, but I think a lot of the times they don't have the time to travel and go to these different spaces to find these masterpieces or even even considering it. Because I just went to a, a print um, discussion where I cannot remember the person's name that was uh, responsible for Latin American art in Houston, um, Houston, I believe. And she's now trying to collect Puerto Rican prints from uh, older periods and contemporary mm -hmm. periods. And the number one problem they're having is when they find these prints, some of them are hammered to the doors of people's <laughs> houses outside. So the yeah. boxing, the moisture ruins these works from the 60s. So they're having a difficult time finding these works. So I think, you know, getting an expert in these spaces to um, go out and do the work. I'm not saying, saying create an elaborate budget because I did it on a very slim budget because I hadn't had a job in four years, mm. I, you know, and I was making money just by selling masterpieces of Belkut Sion's work and other people because it was very difficult to find. So you mentioned just in passing there the, the book that you're writing, which I'd love to talk about, but just from hearing you talk about all your experiences in Cuba, I'm like, you should write a book. You need to write a book about the the association, um, the Association de Grabadores de Cuba, because that it sounds like almost everything that's written is in Spanish. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just going to put more work on your plate. I'm going to volunteer you for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, yeah. I appreciate the encouragement. No, I, I definitely. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be a contributing writer. Maybe I might write a preface, but if everything works out, because that's what I articulated to Dr. Olga Nunez, that if we could reprint this uh, book and add the information mm -hmm. and also do it bilingually, uh, Spanish and English, so and then include the images from the exhibition in 1983, then we could have a masterpiece in our hands, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm working on. You know, hopefully it works because, yeah. uh, you know, I think with the changes now, it's just a little difficult. So hopefully it opens up. Yeah. But so the book that you are writing, you mentioned you're um, writing a book about art collecting. Tell me a bit about that. Yes. Um, well, it, the art collecting, I, I'm definitely going to have it from the perspective of collectors and just my experience, you know, uh, other people have different strategies, techniques, and relationships that they want or don't want with the artist. So I'm going to really talk about my experiences and just talking about uh, operating, you know, not and I'm trying to find a good term to say, it, but a hunter gatherer type of structure. <laughs> so when I would find certain artists in the States, uh, and I like Terry Bodie is one artist, and I, I sent it out to my friends. I'm like, this guy is really impressive. He's a professor at NYU. I was like, let's let me set up a, a joint trip and we'll all go over to his studio and take a look at his work. So, you know, three of us went over there and each of us liked a piece. And so we were able to negotiate a really good price with him. And then now we're giving continued support by spreading the word, people seeing the, the, the works at the house because he did these beautiful canotype prints um, of a project building and slave ships under it, which is basically the funneling of the Black experience of oppression and lack of resources and how just the structure globally treats it. So when I saw this, and I actually saw it in a book, a Caribbean exhibition, I think it took place at the Brooklyn Museum. So I reached out to him. I was like, do you still have this print? And he's like, I got one more left and I was able to acquire this print that's in the book. And I look at it, I'm like the the blue and the white just really is a blue's a calming color and I could actually see it. So it's just like Terry is a really impressive printmaker, you know. So, you know, just teaching people just like going out with groups, you know, not being afraid to do the studio visits, go to an auction, because I wanna actually in, in parallel to the book, I actually want to do tours to museums and auction houses to eliminate this illusion. Because, you know, most of us grew up watching TV. So when you see some rich people throwing up a paddle and they're spending millions of dollars, <laughs> right. that, that could be a deterrent. And I remember my first time going to a print uh, auction at um, Sotheby's. 
it's like 10 people in the room. Mm. <laughs> and usually you see at a full house and then I'm watching the numbers and the phones and it's just like, wow, it's not really what I thought it was based on what I grew up seeing on TV. Right. right. So I want to kind of get everybody comfortable, like going to an auction and, you know, the pre going through the experience of looking at an Andy Warhol print or uh, a Katie Kalowitz or a David Hammond's print, like just getting comfortable in the environment. Cause I think once you become comfortable in the environment, then you could navigate around it more fluidly and more comfortably, especially if you go with the group of people you're comfortable with. And that's something that people really don't realize. I think, at least from my point of view, that really truly hurts the art world in general, I think quite profoundly is that the only way that it's portrayed in the media, as you say, is rich people holding up paddle, spending millions of dollars. And 99.9% of people can't identify with that. They don't see themselves in that. They don't see themselves in that room. They think that that's how art is purchased and Correct. that there's no other options. And so it's really important work to break down those assumptions and to, for people to understand that if you can if you can buy yourself a nice dinner or a nice pair of shoes you can buy yourself a print that you're going to love for the rest of your life absolutely and 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 you know also with that myth of uh millionaire people because then artists are like man these guys have millions of dollars to spend and maybe they'll buy my work. And I also in, in the book want to capture the artist side of things and what artists should be uh, looking for from collectors. Uh, because sometimes, you know, we get enamored with looking at the art news, uh, 200 top collectors. And right. None of them are print, print collectors. And there's only been one and it was a couple out in, uh, I believe, in Texas that collected prints. But nobody's talking about Jordan Schnitzer right. who's opened museums on prints. Like, and so, I know, and when you look at all these people's jobs, it's like real estate investor, philanthropy, mm -hmm. which means they inherited money. So I, I want to <laughs> get both sides of the equation in this book. Like, I want artists to understand, like, it's just, it's a partnership. It's just a, a, not a one-off buy. Some of these collectors are on boards. Some of them have influence in the art world. To How can they support you? Like, there's artists that I've worked with that, you know, they didn't even know how to negotiate with the museum. And I said, you know, let me let me propose something. I'll donate an artwork on your behalf, um, but I want the museum to do a catalog for your work. Yep. And they looked at me like, really? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, let me get in touch with who you're talking to. And then some of them will pass on the donation of the artwork and will be happy to do the catalog. And so the catalog costs me less to do as opposed to giving the artwork away. So it's a win-win for me because I think not only is your body of work important, I think people that do research, because I like when I look at uh, Anna Mendita, when I went to the Met Museum Library, there were dissertations done on her work, her body prints, like, and I was just like, wow, I didn't even think it would be at that level. So these dissertations evolve into books. So, you know, hopefully this is be the same thing for um, the association that Grabador is at Cuba, that maybe it will inspire people to dig deeper and go to Czechoslovakia, Russia, and see what's in the archives and try to dig it up. Because I actually, through the internet, got in touch because I know that the, some of the group members exhibited in Brazil. And they exhibited at the Library of Congress in uh, Washington, D.C., Dallas, Texas. So I I was able to get in touch with people that actually told me there's images available. So I have to make trips to these locations to capture that information. But you would have never known that they they were in these spaces. And I think what you're, what you're talking about, too, with that that kind of negotiation with museums and that sort of thing, that is such a hidden part of the art world from the artist's point of view. And I feel like when you're talking about the experience you had where you reached out to 80 or 100 institutions and didn't even hear back from one. Well, some of them you know? go 
not interested. Okay, guys. So you got some response, but yeah, so you did. You right, didn't hear you, any positive responses. Yeah, um, and, and you know the all and so there's two positive results that just recently came. Yeah. So go, going back to the one book, African American uh, um, Prince from 1838 to oh gosh, what year? 1838 to present, which was. African American printmaking that was done at Rockland Community College. And my mentor, Dr. Edmund Gordon, who was Charles White's dear friend, was in this book. So as I was going through it, I was like, man, I got to look up the curator. So that's where Lena Hugh and Dr. Cynthia Hawkins came up. So Miss Hugh was not available. She retired. So I tracked down Dr. Cynthia Hawkins in, at uh the SUNY, um, the State University of New York University, Geneseo. So I wrote her and sent her my whole catalog on the prints. And she was like, I would be interested in doing it. So I, again, she was a trailblazer in uh, giving the platform for the African-American printmaking. Here she is doing it again. So I'm excited. To, so that exhibition should be taking place September 2022. And she gave me the whole gallery. Oh, the whole beautiful. Thing. Which, you know, I'm just looking forward to it. I'm going to have invites. I, if you're in the States, I would love you to be there. Oh, I'd love you know, that. I, so I, I really want to uh, get it promoted that way. And I want to backtrack to a story. So remember I was talking about Like It Is and how uh -huh. Charles White would flash to the screen? So when I met Dr. Edmund Gordon and Dr. Sue Gordon and his wife, rest in peace, Dr. Edmund Gordon is 97 years old, beautiful spirit. He wrote a letter for me to do continuous work in Cuba regarding this particular print group. So he told me a story that um, after the first season of Like It Is with Gil Noble, ABC was going to cancel it unless they could raise close to $7 million. Mm. And this is dating back to the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Edmund Gordon, uh, former Mayor David Dinkins, and several individuals raised the funds to get that sponsorship. Ugh. And he asked Dr. Uh, he asked uh, Mr. Gil Noble. He's like, "We're going to do this for you. The only thing I ask you to do is get Charlie's work on <gasps> your show." And that's why the drumming. And the vision of Charles White's work flashing to the TV came about. Dr. Edmund Gordon. So these are the type of people I admire because they sacrifice to make sure somebody else gets to get that level of exposure. And look at Charles White now. Right. I mean, I just, during my time at MoMA, uh, we did a whole retrospective on him. And that traveled to California, Chicago. It was a fantastic exhibition. That is so beautiful. I just got goosebumps listening to that story because it's it's so wonderful when people use platforms that way and and the incredible power of just having one or two people in the right place believe in your work. It's it's a amazing. Absolutely. It's absolutely. amazing. Do you happen to know which Charles White print it was I bet I could google it and probably find it out but I'd love to in include it I usually on the website I'll put a collection of images together that go with the podcast release um so maybe I'll have to figure out which one it is so I can add it to the the collection of images that I'll I'll add with this one I will try to dig into it because I you could look up like it is Gil Noble but they never showed the introduction piece so i'll have to see if i could dig it in uh, through libraries but i'll send it to you but i know it was a picture of a man's face mm. and when it came to the screen i was like oh my goodness and that was an elementary school this that's going back like almost 35 years ago mm -hmm. and i still could see it i could hear the drums and the content that was produced on this show was by far the most influential thing and impactful thing in my life when it comes to just culture, African-American mm -hmm. or African diaspora culture. Yeah. Yeah. When I was at Davidson, we had a, we had a handful of Charles White's prints and they're so, so beautiful. But I think that our sort of 
um, hometown African American printmaking hero is of course Jacob Lawrence. Oh and yeah. So when I was there, I had the honor and the pleasure of putting on a couple of Jacob Lawrence exhibitions from some local collectors as well, and um, just really incredible work. And again, something that someone who I feel like like Charles Wright, like maybe broke a little bit out of the the printmaking bubble, became to be known, you know, outside of just us print nerds, but still not nearly widely enough recognized. Um, I think both artists deserve so much more. So, yeah. No, absolutely. And I'm actually currently working on a exhibition for Charles White, but we're also including the people that influenced Charles White and the artists that came after him. Mm. So we're, we're going to be exhibiting, we're still trying to figure out his mentors, but we're going to exhibit works from his peers. Um, and uh, of course, his students. And one piece I know that we're going to be exhibiting a uh, uh, a uh, Kerry James Marshall oh, woodcut uh, uh, during that exhibition, and so it's it, I'm excited about it because it's allowing me to dig deeper into his experiences and learning more about the history, and hopefully uh, it'll work out because we're looking to do it this year in October at the Rockland Art Center, uh, which is located in West Nyack. So. Hoping everything comes out because we already have a lineup of works available mm -hmm. to be exhibited. Yeah, fingers crossed for that, for sure. Well, we're coming up on the hour recording mark here. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that you got a chance to talk about any upcoming events that are on the horizon because we've got... Um, the exhibition in 2022 or was it 2022 or 2021 the 2022 okay. is the association of the grabadors in mm -hmm. upstate new york okay and then fingers crossed as we said for the the charles white this october was there anything else that you want to plug that people can keep their eye out for well right now i in association with um uh, the Association de Grabadores de Cuba, Belkis Ayan, a contemporary printmaker, she passed away, um, is currently exhibiting in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And she actually curated an exhibition for the Association de Grabadores de Cuba. So I actually sent it to the Belkis Ayan estate to share that I had this brochure and they didn't have it in their collection. So I'm trying to help contribute to their her collection of works because she's phenomenal. But I know we talked about uh, or we wrote about um, current contemporary printmakers in Cuba that are making huge strides. And you have Eduardo Choca Roca, who just won the national award uh, in Cuba. Um, and also, Lesbia Vente Dumas just won the national award uh, for printmaking down there as well as of 20, I think 2019. Um, other fantastic printmakers, Angel, Angel Ramirez, who I actually have a work that he collaborated with Belkis Ayan, uh, a huge print called Danjo, Dando y Dando, which is going to be submitted to the San Paulo Brazilian Biennial for exhibition. Um, other key printmakers, Emilis Barito, Jacqueline Barito, Sandra Ramos, uh, Isolina Limonota, of course, uh, Enrique Tente Morales, Ibrahim Miranda, like there's just a whole host of great um, printmakers in Cuba. Yeah. Just phenom phenomenal works. Yeah, I feel like we'll need to have you back on the podcast just to talk about contemporary Cuban printmaking because <laughs> we spent okay. yeah you know we spent so much time talking about historical works as well but and the research you're doing so yeah before we we sign off where would be the best way for people to follow your work or see the promotions and reminders of the exhibitions that are coming up do you have any platforms that you want to push that people can learn more about what you're doing yeah absolutely um right now i'm only on instagram and uh it's at art a-r-t underscore patron p-a-t-r-o-n 
So I post different images on printmaking, sometimes painting, but I try to focus more on printmaking. And eventually I'll be developing a website uh, that will capture what prints I have to kind of give it some context and, you know, let people explore it uh, virtually through the internet. So that's the next phase. That would be amazing. I will definitely look forward to that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. It absolutely um, made my heart feel lighter. <laughs> and it's, it was very needed on, on this end of the mic to just have a beautiful chat like this. And um, I sincerely hope we can, we can do it again and we can stay in touch. And um, please let me know if I can help support what you're doing in any way. Well, likewise, uh, and thank you, because this is the first time I've ever thought to do a podcast. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very private, so I, I, I appreciate your energy, your willingness to uh, have this conversation. And, you know, it's reciprocal. If there's anything I could do to push the movement to help support, I definitely will. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much again, and, and please take care, and let's, um, let's stay in touch. All right, we'll do the same. Okay, have a great evening, Newton. All right, thank you, Miranda. Appreciate it. Yeah, bye now. All right, bye. Well, that's our show for this week. And by the way, print friends, that Charles White exhibition he mentioned, it did end up being rescheduled. So look for that in February 2021. And join me next week when my guest will be Kitty Khan Tilakwatanotai. Kitty Kong has been much talked about on our podcast before by past guests and myself, because truly all printmaking roads here in the Eastern Hemisphere eventually lead to his print studio in Chiang Mai, Thailand. We'll talk about how he got started in his studio apartment, saving up to buy his own shop, studying abroad in Sydney, and his big plans for the future. I'm super excited to share this one because, in a number of ways, there never would have been a pine copper lime if there was no Kitty Kong. You won't want to miss it. This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing help from Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you next week.